serving Christ, but also proclaiming Christ in our daily walk. The title of today's message is, No Matter the Cost. And uh, while I may disagree with Billy Graham on some theological issues, he has a very profound quote. He said once that salvation is free, but there is a price to pay in following Jesus. And so the question I want to ask everybody today is, what are you willing to to give up to be a disciple of Jesus Christ. We understand that salvation is an absolutely free gift. When we believe in Jesus and we receive eternal life, that is 100% free. No strings attached. It is a 100% free gift. But being a disciple of Christ, a learner of Christ, will cost you everything. Being a disciple of Christ and taking up the cross and following him is very, very costly. We understand from Judges 21, 25, uh, this is a time before Israel had a king. This is a time period of lawlessness. And the word describes that culture. It says, in those days, there was no king in Israel. Everyone did what was right in his own eyes. And how much better of a description could you get than today's culture? We see everyone doing what is right in their own eyes. 
We see the slaughter of innocent babies. We see the taking of life. Living life as I construct it to be true is what culture teaches today. Everyone does what's right in their own eyes. And it's becoming progressively harder for Christians to live and follow Jesus and to do those words, to take up the cross daily, because it will cost everything to do so. Mark 8.34 says this. This is Jesus speaking. He says, when he had called the people to himself with his disciples also, he said to them, whoever desires to come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. So one of the keys is to deny oneself. But this is the antithesis to what society today teaches is okay. Because our society today is about fulfilling the lust of the flesh. Whatever I desire to do to make myself feel good, this is what I should do. But Jesus teaches the opposite. To be a true disciple, we have to deny ourselves, take up the cross, and follow him. And so as, as we turn to our primary text here, I'll have you turn to Matthew chapter 10. I want you to really think about this idea of following Christ. Because we know, and this is a common misunderstanding as we turn to Matthew 10, it's a common misunderstanding that every Christian is a disciple of Christ. Every Christian who believes in Jesus, every believer of Jesus Christ has eternal life. But not every believer in Jesus is a disciple. Only those who are willing to lay down their, their desires, their fleshly wants, and carry the cross daily and follow him are said to be disciples. So as we turn to Matthew chapter 10, I want you to think about something as we read what will be our two primary verses. We are going to look at that chapter as a whole, though. But I want you to think, and, and, and think about the words of Jesus I'm about to read here. How often are we confessing Christ as believers? And, and you might not even be necessarily familiar with the term confessing Christ. And if, you, if you're not, then that's something we're going to be really getting into today. Matthew 10, 32. If you go down to verse 32 and 33, this is Jesus speaking to, to the disciples. And he says these powerful words. Therefore, whoever confesses me before men, him I will also confess before my Father who is in heaven. But notice the negative. But whoever denies me before men, him I will also deny before my Father who is in heaven. These are significant words, and this is the mark of discipleship. How much are we confessing Christ in our life? Do we confess Christ daily? Do we daily take up our cross and follow him? Because this is the litmus test to determine discipleship. Rather, we are true disciples of Christ. So to, in today's message, I want to break this down into two parts. First, we're going to discuss and define what it means to confess Christ. And then secondly, and equally as important, we're going to talk about what the rewards are for confessing Christ and the consequences of denying him. Because make no mistake about it, we are eternally secure in Christ. You cannot lose your salvation once you're saved. But there are eternal consequences for believers for rejecting Christ and for denying him publicly. And so we will talk about those as well. And so our first principle here, we're going to be defining what it means to confess Christ. And so I want, to, I want to start with a little bit of historical context here. And so if you look at Matthew, what you have to understand about the Bible, it's broken down into 66 books. There is only one book in the Bible that is written to unbelievers. It's written with the express goal of teaching people how they can have eternal life, and that is the Gospel of John. Every other book in the Bible is written to believers primarily. It's written for the purpose of building believers up in discipleship. That's not to say that those books don't have salvation messages about eternal life and other things like that. It's just that they're not primarily about that. And so we see the same is true for Matthew. We have to understand the historical context of Matthew to really understand these words of Jesus in verse 32 and 33. You see, Matthew was written originally to Jewish believers. The goal of Matthew, while the goal of each of the synoptic gospels is different, the goal of Matthew is to present Jesus as the eternal king. It is to present him as the king that the Jews had been seeking all along. The king has arrived, you could say, is the theme. And so one of the main goals of Matthew's text, if you read it, is to not only talk about Jesus being king, the kingship of Christ, but it's also to describe or give like a guideline, if you will, of what believers are to do in light of this coming kingdom. 
how believers are, are to conduct themselves in the light of Jesus coming back as the eternal king. And not only that, you can think of it as like an instruction guide for believers. These are the things we should do so that we might participate in this kingdom someday, so that we might inherit eternal reward. This is a topic that a lot of churches leave out. Maybe it's because uh, it won't draw large audiences. Maybe perhaps it makes people feel uncomfortable. But the topic of eternal rewards is very real. Jesus is coming, and he's going to establish a kingdom. Some Christians will inherit eternal reward in this coming kingdom, and some will be denied eternal reward based on how they've lived and used their talents. If you read Matthew 25, the parable of the workers. And so we have to understand this is the context of Matthew. And right as Jesus is giving these words, he is sending his disciples out into a world in which they will face fierce persecution. Now, read with me in Matthew 10, 5 through 7. If you go back to verses 5 through 7, they will surely receive persecution for the message that they are about to bring to the world. It says, These twelve Jesus sent out and commanded them, saying, Do not in go into the way of the Gentiles. And do not enter a city of the Samaritans, but go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. And as you go, preach, saying, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And so what we have to understand here in this context, Jesus is sending his disciples out to preach about the coming kingdom. And we'll talk about what that phrase means in a second. But what we have to understand, this preaching... Our preaching of God's word cannot be disconnected from what Jesus says in verse 32 and 33. In order to properly preach Jesus Christ, we must confess Jesus Christ. Preaching without confessing Jesus Christ is hollow and empty. It's not real preaching. So what we have to understand, this is why in 32 and 33, he's telling them to confess Jesus, to confess him before men. Uh, if you're taking notes, the Greek word there for confess in verse 32 and 33 is Greek word 3670. And it, it basically means to declare openly, to speak out freely. And we have to understand here, this type of uh, confessing Christ, uh, when it says before men, this is talking about society in general. This is not necessarily, uh, you know, a specific group. This is talking about society in general. And so what Jesus is saying to the believers here, to his disciples, is that there's a couple things. We have to consider what society is comprised of. First of all, we understand that these disciples were to preach eternal life. We see that in the Gospel of John. John 3.16, you go down the list. John describes how to have eternal life. Simply believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved, Acts 16. So these disciples, as Jesus was releasing them to preach and to confess him before men, before society, number one was to preach eternal life, and we see that. But in this particular context, they are also to proclaim the coming of Christ to the Jewish believers. This is, of course, in the context, we have to understand, this is preaching to the nation of Israel. The disciples were to go out and proclaim that the king has come. He has come, he has died on the cross, but he is coming back a second time. And so they are also to proclaim to believers, number one, that Jesus was returning, but also to proclaim to believers how they should live their life in the here and now in light of eternity, in light of the fact that Jesus is coming back. So make no mistake about it. These apostles, as they would come to be called, are not just speaking to unbelievers. They are preaching the word to believers as well. Because it's not just unbelievers who need to hear the word. It is believers too. It is those who have strayed away from the truth and need to hear the word of God. It is those who um, are serving him and need to, need to be built up by encouragement from his word. And so we understand that we as Christians, if we apply this to us today, we have the same calling. We're to share the gospel of Jesus Christ with those who have not heard. But that, that's not where our preaching should end. Our preaching should include people who are believers, who have already believed on the Lord Jesus Christ and are maybe not walking the way that they should. But it should also include people who are believing and also growing in Christ so that we might see them grow and inherit eternal reward someday. So this is, as Jesus says, to confess him before men is to confess him before believers, 
and unbelievers. And that's, I think, part of what oftentimes gets left out with this particular passage. And so when we confess Jesus, what does that specifically mean to speak out freely? It's not just simply saying, I believe in Jesus. I believe that Jesus existed. I believe that Jesus was the Son of God. I want to give you a comprehensive definition that I developed over some time of looking at this passage. And this definition, I think, really gets at the heart of what the Greek is talking about. So I would define confessing Jesus as this. It is a public alignment with Christ and his teachings in both word and action with the intention of leading people to Christ regardless of the consequences or repercussions that we may face. Now that last part is the challenging part. This is a public alignment with Jesus Christ, his person, who he is, and his teachings, regardless of the consequences. Look at verse 27 in chapter 10. Notice what Jesus says here. He emphasizes the public nature of this confession. He says, whatever I tell you in the dark, speak in the light, and what you hear in the ear, preach on the rooftop. And so is this kind of preaching just for pastors? Is it just for me standing up here and delivering this message? The answer, simply put, is no. This is a, the job of every believer is to confess him before men publicly, to publicly align ourselves with Jesus Christ. And you think about the consequences of that and saying that I believe Jesus rose from the dead. I believe what the word of God says as sin is sin. I believe that there is only one way to heaven, and that is Jesus Christ. Sorry, Oprah, there is only one way back to the Father, and that is by believing in Jesus Christ. There are not many ways to heaven. That is a lie from Satan. And by saying these things, we're going to be called narrow-minded. We're going to be called dogmatic. But we must believe in the Lord Jesus Christ regardless of the consequences and stand on his teaching publicly. Because it says, if we deny him, he will deny us. And so that is a very, very important teaching. And so we see that um, this is including, if we look at culture today, we understand that cultural norms are changing. The, sh the shifting sands of culture are, are always changing. But Jesus Christ, as Hebrews 13 says, is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And so are his teachings. And so that's what we must stand on. So the question is, why do Christians then not confess Christ? I'm going to give you two reasons why I think many believers today are, are afraid to confess Christ and publicly align themselves. The first is found in 1 John 2, 15 through 17. If you want to turn there really quick. Give me a drink here. 1 John 2, 15 through 17. I'm giving you two reasons why, in my opinion here, based on, this, based on the word, not just things I'm pulling out of nowhere... Why, why believers are so anxious to do this today? And I think this is one of the main things, especially in light of what we saw in the opening section. Everybody wants to do what's right with their own eyes. I would say the first is that many Christians are compromising their walk by living in the flesh. Many Christians are willing to compromise their walk by living in the flesh. Notice what John says in 1 John 2, 15 through 17. He says, Do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. And the world is passing away, and the lust of it. But he who does the will of God abides forever. So I think one is this insatiable desire to fulfill the lust of the flesh. Many Christians are willing to compromise what they believe because they want to gratify the sinful lust of the flesh. And I think that that's very true. But you also see, uh, in, in some cases, whenever we're dealing with this issue as pastors, this second issue might be equally as challenging to deal with. Um, I think that the second reason is that a lot of Christians today enjoy the idea of being comfortable. A lot of Christians enjoy the idea of just coasting along in their faith and saying, I'm comfortable, I'm doing what I can for Jesus, I'm not receiving persecution, I don't want to ruffle any feathers by taking a strong stand for him. Now notice what it says in verse 24 through 26 back in chapter 10 of Matthew, back in our primary text, because Jesus talks about this. And I want to make, I want to make an argument today that if we are comfortable Christians, 
we're not true disciples of Jesus Christ if we're living comfortable Christianity. Notice what verse 24 through 26 says. A disciple is not above his master, nor a servant above his master. And how did they treat Jesus? Think about how Jesus was persecuted. It is enough for a disciple that he be like his teacher and a servant like his master. If they have called the master of the house Beelzebub, talking about Satan, how much more will they call those of his household? Therefore, do not fear them, for there is nothing covered that will be, uh, not be revealed and hidden that will not be known. So here is a true litmus test to determine if we are disciples. Have we ever faced persecution for our faith? Now, this isn't to say that we should just go out and be abrasive and try to get people to persecute us. But it's saying that if you walk through the Christian life comfortably and you never face one bit of persecution for your walk, then you are not a true disciple of Christ because no disciple is greater than his teacher. And no disciple is greater than his master. If they persecuted Christ, they will persecute us. If they hated Christ, then you best believe they will hate us. And so we must take a stand for Jesus Christ and confess him. Now notice the kind of uh, persecution in verse 16 through 22 here. So we're kind of not exactly going in order of this passage, but 16 through 22. Notice this. Behold, I send you out as sheep in the midst of wolves. Therefore, be wise as serpents and harmless as doves. But beware of men, for they will deliver you up to councils and scourge you in their synagogues. You will be brought before governors and kings for my sake as a testimony to them and to the Gentiles. But when they deliver you up, do not worry how you will, should speak. For it will be given to you in the hour what you should speak. For it is not you who speak, but the spirit of your father um, who speaks in you. Now brother will deliver, uh, deliver up brother to death and a father his child. And children will rise up against their parents and cause them to be put to death. And you will be hated by all for my name's sake. But he who endures to the end will be saved. So I want you to really think about these words. Really think about the kind of persecution, the cost that comes with aligning yourself with Jesus. When you align yourself with Jesus, it may cost you friendships. It may cost you fun, going out with certain groups of people. It may cost you, um, you know, a job. If you stand up for what you believe in Jesus and you, you refuse to compromise your walk, and, and for some, we see in the world today, for some of our brothers and sisters who are overseas in the front lines in the missionary work, it will cost them their very life serving Jesus as a disciple. But this is the call of Christ. We must deny ourselves and follow him. Be willing to confess him no matter the cost, no matter the consequences. But notice verse 18. There is one significant phrase in verse 18 that you'll notice. What is the purpose of our persecution? It is that it should be a testimony. Notice those words in verse 18. Our persecution is a testimony. It is an opportunity to deliver the word of God to those who need to hear it. It is an opportunity to preach Christ to those who are persecuting us. And, and, and make no mistake about it, God allows trials into our life. That's what James chapter 1 is about. But this is a testimony so that we might testify and confess publicly that Jesus Christ is the only way to heaven and that he is Lord and to confess him before men, before an unbelieving society. And so why should we be confident in these moments? If you look back at verse 19 and 20, it's because the words that we speak in these situations as believers, we have been sealed by the Holy Spirit of promise. That's Ephesians 1, 13 and 14. It says here that the Holy Spirit will give us the words to say. And so we should not fear what society will do to us because we have the Holy Spirit of God to tell us what to say in the moment. But I want you to also realize the reality of why this is so important. Because if the, word, if the Holy Spirit gives us the words to say in the moment when we need them during this persecution, this is also why the stakes are so high. This is why denying Christ publicly is such a, a grievous offense before God. Because these are the very words that God is giving us to speak. These are the situations that God has put us in so that we might minister for him as a testimony. And so if we refuse to speak those words in the moment God has for us to speak them, we are denying the Holy Spirit what he would have us to say. And so that is the significance of this denial. And so it's not just an embarrassment. This is a denial to follow through what God has for us. So 
To recap the first point, confessing Christ is a public alignment with Christ in his teachings in both word and action. So remember that, word and action, with the intention of leading people to Christ, regardless of the consequences or repercussions that we may face. Now, the second principle is equally as important, because these are the consequences and rewards. I want to make it very clear today. There are rewards and consequences for either confessing Christ and or denying him. And so what we have to understand, all throughout the New Testament and Old Testament, the topic of eternal rewards is very real. And, and this is not to, you know, be too fire and brimstone like today. But for believers, again, we are eternally secure in Christ. But that does not change the reality. Just because we can't lose our salvation doesn't mean that our actions now do not ripple in eternity. Some believers, as we're going to see in a few passages, will inherit eternal reward. They will be given stewardship of the kingdom of God. That's what we mean when we say inherit the kingdom. But some will be denied this. For some Christians, because of their actions and the way that they live their life, Christ will be ashamed of them when he returns in the glory of his Father. In, in the company of his, of his angels. And so we see that we want to be in one category and surely not in the other. Now, this is too big of a topic to really discuss in one message. We cover this a lot in our Hebrew study in the mornings. But I want to give you a few really important points to think about in Matthew 10, dealing with eternal rewards and loss of rewards. Remember those words of Jesus in verse 32. He says, Him I will confess before my Father who is in heaven. That's the person who confesses Jesus. But then you also have him denying the person who denies him before the Father. So the question is, what does it mean to say that Jesus will confess us before the Father? And in order to find the answer to this question, we have to look back at verse 22. You'll read with me in verse 22. Jesus makes a very, very interesting claim in verse 22. He says, And you will be hated by all for my name's sake, but he who endures to the end will be saved. Now, when most people just look at this verse, they immediately say, this is talking about getting to heaven. I have to endure to get to heaven. But what we understand in the scripture, this is, this is not what this verse is talking about. The Greek word for salvation is soteria. It's a word that has a lot of uses. And the word soteria in the Greek, you might be surprised to know this or hear this, is that that word in the New Testament is primarily, when it's used, primarily does not refer to salvation from hell. It's referring to other types of salvation. Why is that the case? Because the word salvation is the word to deliver. It means to deliver from something and to something. And so you could be talking about the salvation of your physical life. There's a variety of types of salvation. In this particular case, this is talking about a future aspect of salvation. Now, how do we know that this is not talking about salvation from hell? Number one, I'll say this very briefly because I want to get into what this actually is talking about. But we know that this is not talking about salvation from hell for a few reasons. Number one, if you'll remember, salvation is an absolutely free gift. He who believes in me has everlasting life. It's 100% free. Ephesians 2, 8, and 9, it's without works. This type of salvation in Matthew 10, 22 is earned by enduring. Our salvation from hell is not earned. It's because Jesus paid the price and we believe in him. That's the only reason any of us are saved, not because of our actions, our deeds, our behaving until the end or enduring until the end. That's one. But the other thing is, if you'll notice in John 6, 6, 47, which I just quoted, he who believes in me has everlasting life. The moment you believe in Jesus, that's the same moment you have everlasting life. This type of salvation in Matthew 10, 22 is not gained until we have successfully endured. And so therefore, the two types of salvation cannot be the same. It's the same Greek word, but a different use. And so what we have to understand, this is talking about a future deliverance for the confessing believer. This is talking about the believer who is, is a enduring believer, a persevering believer in faith throughout their life. And the result of that, when it says that this person will be saved, those who endure, that's to say that Jesus will confess him before my Father who is in heaven. Make no mistake about it, the two are the same thing. Verse 32 and verse 22 are the same thing. 
Those who endure to the end faithfully through the persecution will be confessed by Jesus before the Father. But those who don't will not. Those who don't will be denied. And so we have to ask what that denial means. But first, I want to give you three aspects of this future deliverance. I want you to really think about this. I know this is technical, but this is very, very important because this affects our future status in the kingdom of God. But it also is very important because this, this really elaborates on what Jesus is talking about in verse 32 when he says, I will confess him before my Father who is in heaven. I want to give you three aspects to this future deliverance or this future salvation. Number one, this believer who endures faithfully, number one, will be delivered through their persecution victoriously. And so that's the one, number one thing I want you to realize. You know, that's not to say that the persecution is going to be easy. That's not to say everything's going to be feel good and awesome. But that's to say those who endure faithfully and confess Christ will be delivered through that trial victoriously. The way that God would have them to live through it. Because God will be with that believer. But the other aspect of this is found in 1 Corinthians 3 and 2 Corinthians 5. Uh, I'm going to be referencing 1 Corinthians 3 really quickly if you're a quick page turner. But the second aspect of this future deliverance is this. That the believer who confesses Jesus faithfully will be delivered from the wrath of Christ at his future judgment seat. And so just because we are Christians and have eternal life, that does not mean that we automatically escape judgment. Every single believer, according to 1 Corinthians 3 and 2 Corinthians 5, will stand before Jesus Christ at his judgment seat. It's a judgment for only believers. And in that judgment, he will audit every single thing, every action, every thought, every single word that we've ever done throughout our entire life. And notice what Paul says in 1 Corinthians 3, 14 and 15. If anyone's work which he has built on it, talking about the gold, the, the comparison of the different works in that chapter, it says he will receive a reward. If anyone's work is burned, talking about the straw and the hay when it's put through the fire, if anyone's work is burned, he will suffer loss, but he himself will be saved, yet so as through fire. And so think, what kind of believer do you want to be? Do you want to be the kind of believer that hears, well done, good and faithful servant? You enter into an eternal inheritance? Or do you want to be the kind of believer who will stand before Jesus Christ and see <laughs> every single vain, worthless work that we've done burned before him and, and, and not hear those words, well done, good and faithful servant, and lose that eternal reward. So we understand that by persevering and confessing Jesus and enduring to the end, we will avoid that wrath of Christ when he returns and judges every believer. And finally, number three, this is also very important. James 1.12 says this, Blessed is the man who endures temptation. For when he has been approved, he will receive the crown of life which the Lord has promised to those who love him. So what we have to understand about the crown of life, this is an eternal reward. Rewards are eternal. Loss of rewards are eternal. There is nothing in scripture to indicate that these reward distinctions will ever end. And so this is very important. Those who persevere will receive the eternal crown, the eternal reward. And that, you know, obviously carries a big connotation. That's a whole other study to get into what the crown of life is. But um, I want to now talk about the flip side of this as we get towards the closing of this message. What about those who don't confess Christ? Because we understand that those who do, Jesus will openly endorse them before God the Father. He will openly confess their name before God the Father as someone who has persevered in the faith, as someone who has earned an eternal inheritance and an eternal reward. But what about those who don't? Notice it says, but whoever denies me in verse 33 of chapter 10 before men, him I will also deny before my Father who is in heaven. Remember Paul's words in 1 Corinthians 3.15, if anyone's work is burned, he will suffer loss. This type of believer will be denied eternal reward. And so we have to think here. If we confess Christ, he will confess us. But if we deny him, we will be denied the right of inheritance of the kingdom. We will be denied eternal reward. And I can't emphasize how important that is, that we live in light of eternity. And that should give us motivation to confess Christ every single day. Uh, in 2 Timothy 2, 11 through 13, it says this. Paul's citing a very, very old hymn of the church. 
This is perhaps one of the oldest parts of the New Testament. This is a very ancient hymn. It says this, This is a faithful saying, Paul writes to Timothy, For if we died with him, we shall also live with him. Talking about the resurrection at the end day. Now catch this. If we endure, we shall also reign with him. Again, you see the connection between that and what Jesus' words say. If we endure, we shall reign with him. Now catch the second part of this. If we deny him, he will also deny us. So what we have to understand in the context of that verse 12, if we deny Jesus, he will deny us the right to rule and reign with him. You have to understand heaven is not a bunch of clouds and people turning into angels and floating around and playing harps and singing kumbaya. God will recreate the heaven and earth and Jesus is going to reign as the eternal king. Some will inherit this kingdom with him and some believers will lose that right of inheritance. And that's the reality of heaven. And that should cause us as Christians to live soberly. Now notice the end of this, though. He does give us hope in verse 13 of 2 Timothy 2. He says, if we are faithless, he remains faithful. He cannot deny himself. So no believer will ever be lost. None. Because John chapter 5, starting in verse 24, says that they have passed from death to life. If you have believed in Jesus Christ, you are eternally secure. But I hope that these realities, the fact that we can lose our reward, the fact that there are consequences for disobedience, I hope that it gets us to live soberly and, and faithfully to Christ and to confess him. So we've talked, number one today, about what it means to confess Christ. It is a public alignment with Christ and his teachings, both in action and word, with the intention of leading people to Christ, regardless of the consequences and repercussions that we may face. But the second thing is, the rewards and the consequences are real. Jesus is coming, and we will stand before him as believers someday. So, understand this in Matthew 10, 34 through 39, in closing, Jesus says these words about what we will face when we choose to step in as disciples and carry our cross. Do not think that I came to bring peace on earth. I did not come to bring peace, but a sword. For I have come to set a man against his father, a daughter against her mother, and a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. And a man's enemies will be of his own household. He who loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. And he who loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And he who does not take up his cross and follow me after me is not worthy of me. He who finds his life will lose it, and he who loses his life for my name's sake will find it. My sake will find it. And so we have to understand that in these closing words here, Jesus is urging us to forsake all and follow him. Mark 8, 38, For whoever is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation of him, the Son of Man will also be ashamed when he comes in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. So I would encourage you today, church, to confess Jesus Christ. Regardless of the consequences, take a stand for him in your workplace. Take a stand for him in your friendships. Whatever it is that you need to confess to get right with God, confess him publicly. Proclaim the Lord Jesus Christ. There are people dying and going to hell who need to hear the good news of Jesus Christ. There are those who have strayed from the Christian faith who need to be brought back. And we need to proclaim him regardless of the consequences. If you're here today and you have not believed in Jesus Christ, understand this. God sent his son, the perfect lamb of God, who takes away the sins of the world. He has paid the penalty for every single sin that every person who has ever lived committed on the cross. And there's only one thing to do to have eternal life, and that is to believe in him. Believe that Jesus is the only one who can guarantee you eternal salvation. If you believe that, he says, he who believes in me has everlasting life. You have eternal life if you believe that promise. So the question today is, have you believed that promise? And then number two, if you have, what are you going to do about it? How is it going to affect your life? And so um, as we uh, t turn the, the floor over to Brother Carl here um, uh, for our closing uh, hymn, um, I want you to really reflect on these words and really think about what we talked today about today. And Brother Carl's going to close this hymn.
consider, Lord, the relationship that we have with you and the call that you have placed upon our lives. We pray, Father God, that indeed, daily, we will stand up for Jesus. That we will ask ourselves that important question each day as the day ends. Have I been a testimony to the greatness of Jesus Christ by my words and by my actions this day? And Father, as we consider that, for the next day and the days that follow, may we focus our lives on standing up for you who died for us. Father, as we leave this place, we, we pray that your blessing goes with us. And we pray, Father, that you will empower us to live lives of acceptable service to you. For it's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Amen.